everybody. Good day. It's starting to look a little more like spring out there. Um, I couldn't have asked for better intro music. Um, so today, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, at the top of class. Also, of course, you know, feel free to interject uh, if you have a question as we're moving along. Um, today, we are going to go back to our model, and we're not doing that. That's next week. I just wanted to check on that. Um, we are uh, dem going to demonstrate how to use lighting in Rhino today. So um, as we move on to that, does anybody have any uh, sort of burning questions? No? OK. Um, I actually have a kind of side topic question for you all, and that is that um, you know, for the last couple of years, I have definitely tried to put an emphasis on flexibility for you all uh, in terms of attend attendance, um, because I understand that, you know, I just got COVID myself like three weeks ago. So, I, I mean, obviously that's still a thing. Um, one thing that I was thinking about um, is maybe not necessarily still requiring people to, uh, I'm thinking about fall semester. So I'm not thinking, I guess just conceptually, like I'm not really comfortable with taking it, take, requiring people to attend, you know, because it's a tight environment. Um, people have different reasons why they might not want to be in a lecture room or whatever. Um, so what I was thinking about doing next semester is creating a series of Canvas quizzes that would kind of appear randomly throughout the semester and just offering extra credit. Does that sound like reasonable? Yeah? Is anybody like, no, that's stupid. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> OK. All right. If you have any opinions about it or you want to tell me you know, anything that like your other instructors are doing that's working really well, um, just let me know. I mean, I feel like ultimately like, I just want to stay committed to sort of offering people flexibility. You know. Um, so, OK. Anyway, uh, let's jump into our Rhino project. So I actually did, um, these are just a couple of tests that I did, so let me quick get rid of this. So this is exactly where we left off last class period. And um, what we're going to want to do is we're going to place some lighting objects in the scene. And uh, one thing that I'd like to do, and I'll go ahead and do this now rather than later, is I'm going to create a, like an object that is going to function like a lamp. Um, and so in other words, uh, I'm going to create an object that is made specifically for light to pass through it. Um, so how I'm going to do that, I'll go ahead and just make the object. I think I'm going to start with um, a curve. So. Um, one thing that I probably will like to do in this case is just get rid of the boat and uh, get rid of the, um, da, da, da. this rock I think I'm going to put on a different layer so I can temporarily get rid of it. So I'm just going to call this uh, rock. Um, and then make that layer invisible. And so now uh, we're pretty much down to the default layer and the room. Um, now, the only reason that I want to include the room while I'm drawing this object is that I want it there as a scale reference. So I, I definitely don't want to be able to snap to it or um, kind of have, thing, have it get in the way. So if I want it to still be visible, but I don't want to be able to interact with it in any way, uh, locking it is a great option. So if I just click the little lock button, then um, inevitably, you know, later on in the class period, I'll try to do something to it, and I'll be like, damn it, it's locked. Um, but you know, it, you can't have one without the other. So um, I would definitely go ahead and just lock that, because I do want to have some idea of like, how large this object is and how it's going to sit in the room. So I think I'm going to start with um, the side view, and I'm just going to make a curve. I'm going to make a pretty simple curve. Um, I also want to probably disable the object snaps right now because they're just not going to do anything anyway. Um, I'm in ortho mode right now, so for drawing curves, that might not be the very best thing. Um, and I'm just going to make like a very gently sloping curve, dare we say subtle even. And I'm going to put it down there and stop. 
And so the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make a circle, and I'm going to use the, um, the uh, point here um, as a sort of the end point for the circle. So if I zoom in here, let's see. Let me double check what, where my units are. So probably I want the circle to be like two or three of these big units. So somewhere around there. And then I want that end to just snap to the end of that other thing. It's not, in this case, it's not totally necessary that they snap together, but I'm just one of those people, like if I have the option for something to snap, it's so much better if it does. So um, we've done revolves a couple times in this class. Um, I think that we've also done rail revolves. So to create this form, I'm just gonna do a simple rail revolve. And I can go up here to surface and do a sweep, or rather a rail revolve. That's what I actually just said. And so the rail curve in this case is, um, I'm gonna actually go into this with nothing selected. And if I do a rail revolve now, it asks me for the profile curve, which is the sort of upright curve. And then, of course, um, I hit enter when I shouldn't have. So then it asks you to select the rail curve and, <laughs> sorry y'all, I'm a little jumpy today. Um, then you select the rail curve and then you have to define the axis. So I would maybe just make that slightly larger than the sort of full size of what I'm looking for with the object. I'm gonna hit the shift key so it ends up on ortho and then it will give me the result that I desire. Um, no skipping ahead for this. Um, my fingers are just a little twitchy today. So, um, okay, so this is a sort of, you know, within the realm of like, you know, stuff that we've definitely done multiple times. Um, and what I'm gonna do next, I probably will go ahead and get rid of the room at this point, and I'd like to create intersection objects that will intersect with this. Now, this is a bare surface, so I could cap planar holes and then use the shell command to create like a, a shell. It's not actually totally necessary because in this case, I'm not printing, I'm just using it as a, a light object. So the only good thing about maybe creating a shell um, out of this uh, before we have intersecting objects is that when you create a shell, it will make an interior wall and having that interior wall, it will have the right side of the surface facing towards the interior, which means you might get some extra, extra bounce. The light will be able to bounce off of it. Where right now, because we just have um, a straight up uh, surface, you can see that the inside is what we call in computer graphics a back face. And a back face basically means that it's not supposed to ever be visible. Um, and it's sort of like letting your underwear hang out. Um, it's like the computer graphics equivalent of that. Um, but, you know, in this case, it probably won't matter because light is gonna be coming out of the object and, you know. So, long explanation for a very, fairly minor detail. Um, I think I am gonna go ahead and cap this just because I feel like it's a little more thorough and a little more um, kind of proper. So now I've capped those planar holes, and what I wanna do is I wanna use the shell command, uh, which I know we've also done before um, in these demos, and uh, I'm just gonna pick this top surface, and then it asks me for a thickness. And so a thickness of one, I think, is totally sufficient for this, because all I really want to do is just have it have a front face. And so now you can see that that front face, see how light is sort of, or what we you know, maybe think of as light, is actually intersecting and bouncing around inside of it, right? So it's one of those things. It's a fairly minor thing, but um, it's probably worth doing. So, um, whoa, hello. Um, I'll get this down here for a second. Um, okay, so the next thing is we're gonna make uh, intersection objects. So probably for these intersection objects, I'm going to want to use these two views, the top and the front, um, just based on where I have this right now. And um, I'm gonna make uh, basically uh, just a box. And this box, I'll make it a few units by a few units. 
And so then for the height, I want to make it pretty long. Um, and I want it to be pretty long because we're going to do some other stuff to it where I want to make sure that it fully clears the, the lamp object, OK? So we'll come back to this little box object after we do a couple of other things. So um, another thing that I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and make a spiral um, that kind of goes inside this object. And so in order to do that, I'm going to go up here to the curve menu, and I'm going to go to the vertical helix option. Um, what's the difference between a helix and a vertical helix? One is vertical, one is not. It's that simple. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start. I would really like to start um, somewhere near the center of this object, although it's not really a precise matter, so I can just looks like this point is just about in the right place. And then the end of the axis would be the top of this thing. And it looks like I'm going to just hit the shift key. Hang on just a second. So it looks like I accidentally, because my fingers are twitchy today, it looks like I accidentally selected helix instead of vertical, vertical helix. Um, which it might be why it wasn't necessarily doing exactly what I wanted it to do. So maybe I'll start somewhere around here. OK, so I obviously selected the wrong option, which is totally fine. We're going to take it, we're going to make it this way, and we're going to flip it into, into shape. Um, so. Then it asks you for uh, a radius and a start point, and I actually want the radius to be fairly tight. Um, I could add turns to the whole affair if I wanted to. That would make it a little denser. I think this is totally fine uh, where the settings are right now. Um, and again, I, as I said before, I wanted to make it fairly tight. So now I'm going to rotate it into place because apparently my fingers are twitchy today. Um, and I'll do that in the right view. We may have to um, just kind of scale it into shape as well. I'll start with just a regular rotation and select that object. Um, then it asks you for the center of rotation, which I definitely would like to, at this point, bring my object snaps back and try to find the endpoint of the thing. So that is maybe go a little further in there. Hello. You. Um, so right now, actually, you might notice that it's kind of snapping to another point. And that's a pretty common problem. I'm just going to escape out of this so I can do it one more time. Um, if we wanted that to go away, we could turn off the Smart Track option. Um, and when you have the Smart Track option off, um, it's much more kind of deliberate. It won't sort of magnetize to other objects outside of the thing that you're looking for. So, OK, so basically we just want to kind of run out here at a 90 degree angle. I could hit the shift key to keep it nice and straight. And then I want it to be straight, so I'm just going to hit the ortho key. And wow, it looks like I guesstimated the size of this pretty, pretty awesomely. So um, that was just pure dumb luck. Um, so the next thing I want to do is to take this box. And I'm just going to do a little bit of scaling and flipping. Um, so I'm not really crazy about the idea of like these square shapes being kind of embedded in this object. I'd like to have something that looks more like a diamond, right? Um, like an elongated diamond. So first step to that is to definitely rotate this um, so that it is in that orientation. And then if I want to scale it perfectly, I think we've all been sort of doing this scaled 3D thing, which is super great. It's useful if you want to have a uniform scale. But in this case, we actually want to kind of warp it um, by scaling it. So I'm going to select a scale 1D, which is probably my second favorite scale method. And I'm going to click the endpoint here. Let me go ahead and zoom in just a tiny bit. I'll click the endpoint here, this endpoint, and then I'm just going to um, go like a little bit further down to kind of elongate it. OK? So now I have my diamond-shaped box. 
And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take this shape and I'm going to take this spiral and I'm going to make the shape uh, repeat uh, conforming to a spiral, okay? And then we're going to take all of those shapes, there might be 50 or 60 of them, and I'm going to subtract them from, from the lamp, okay? So then the lamp will be filled with this like whole pattern, okay? So it's just, I want to show you how to do this because it's just a different way to think about light. Um, I think there's one, you know, really obvious way to think about light, which is like that, right? Like you have an, a light object and it's falling on things. But having light pass through other things just creates like a much more dynamic environment. So, um, yeah, so how we're going to do this is we're going to uh, not select anything right now. We're going to go to the transform menu and select the array option. Now, I'm showing you how to do an array along curve. There are many other excellent array options, and it's a really great way to get a lot of repeated forms very quickly. So if you wanted to create a grid of things, you could do the rectangular array. If you wanted to repeat things around a circle, that's the polar array, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's definitely like one of, you know, the, as a, when I'm making physical objects, I use it a lot because I work with repetition a lot. Um, so I'm going to select array along curve for this. And first it asks you to select objects to array, which is this. And uh, press enter. And then it asks you to select the path curve, which is this curve that we just did. Now, we could accept this um, as is, but I want to show you some of your options here. So this looks maybe a little bit more um, chaotic than what I was hoping for. So one thing that we can specify is we can specify the distance between objects. So right now it's set to 10. Let's try maybe t changing that to something low, like two. Okay, so now you can see we've got like a ton of these things. Um, that might actually be a bit, a bit much. Um, maybe I'll aim for the middle and say five here. Yeah, okay. And then under orientation, um, there's a couple of different rotation modes that you can select. So no rotation I would not necessarily recommend because uh, that sort of doesn't really conform to the, to the curve. But if that's what you're looking for, I guess that's okay. Um, the freeform option is going to tend to look much more chaotic. Um, and then the road-like option is going to tend to kind of follow the, the actual form a little bit better. So I'm going to just kind of accept this, I think. Um, I can also, you can also have it like work from a certain viewport, which um, that can really shift things. So let me just show you that, that one more time, um, working from the other viewport. Oops, I messed up, sorry. Twitchy fingers today. Select path curve. Um, yeah, so in this case, I actually happen to like the front viewport. I mean, that's exactly what I want. But if you do type in a different viewport, you can get a different configuration of, of repetition. Um, so I'm going to, as just to kind of get us in the place that we were before, I'm going to change this to five. And I'm just going to uh, accept this and say that it's done. So um, definitely don't panic if you've got shapes that are sort of hanging off the edges and all that stuff, because we are totally going to get rid of all of those. So at this point, what I would probably advise you to do is to um, select the original polysurface. I'm going to put this on a different layer. Um, just make a new layer for it and just call it maybe lamp. Um, the reason I'm getting rid of this um, is because uh, I would really like to be able to very easily select all the other objects. Um, there's probably another way for me to do that, actually, um, and I'll show you that in a second. We'll use it this, uh, during class today. So I'm going to go ahead and move this object here and just get rid of it for a second. And then uh, I'm going to, you may notice there's a few curves sort of 
strung through here. So I could certainly get rid of these curves if I feel like they're a distraction, and obviously I feel that way right now, so uh, I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm just gonna put them in my sort of curve layer, but uh, basically what I wanted to do is do that. Um, and from here, I'd like to just make a group and then uh, bring back the other sort of lamp object. And right at this moment, we're gonna go ahead and do that subtraction. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a Boolean process. Um, we've used Boolean processes before. I think that was like day two, maybe. Um, so yeah, select this polysurface. Um, actually, I may go into it with nothing selected, which I think would be preferable because then it, it actually asks you like the proper order in which to select things. So I'm gonna go up here and go to the solid uh, menu. Now we've done Boolean two objects, um, which is cool, but Boolean two objects is literally does exactly what it says on the tin. It only Booleans two objects. And as you can see, we have like 61 maybe or 51 objects. So we can't use Boolean two objects for this. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take one object that is a single object, and then we're trying to take this set of objects and remove it from that, from that object. So that happens to be the difference method. Um, so if we use any of these methods, these three methods that are listed there, you can use sets of objects rather than two singular objects. So we'll go ahead and go to difference. So it says select surfaces or poly surfaces to subtract from. So that's definitely this, okay? And we hit enter, and then it says select surfaces or poly surfaces to subtract with. Okay, that's the second set here, which we've grouped, so that makes it really nice and easy to select. Um, and then you basically hit enter. Now, you have the option of deleting your input. In this case, I actually don't care about these you know, rectangular sh uh, box shapes. Like, they can just, they can just go away. Um, if you do want to retain what you make, uh, you know, the two pieces, then by all means, unselect that option, and it will leave you the, the new set and the old objects in the same place. Which a lot of people get confused about that because then you, it's hard to tell if it worked um, because the old objects are still sitting there. So that's one of the reasons why I'm deleting the input right now. So, hey, guess what? It's gonna take more than like a fraction of a second because you're asking it to do a lot of heavy lifting. Um, so this is basically what we get left with. And it's not super exciting right now, but I think um, we can definitely uh, put it into our scene and stick some lights in it. And it's basically like, it's basically like my answer to party lights in Rhino. Um, so I feel like we always need some party lights, um, especially this time of year, my goodness, I'm so ready to party. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna do a little tiny bit of layer maintenance here. So this lamp object is still on the original layer that I stuck it on, so that's nice. I can bring back the room, and uh, we're really gonna get into this conversation about lighting. So it looks like my lamp has uh, somehow migrated a bit, so we'll fix that. And um, I'm gonna get rid of this layer because this was just me kind of warming up. So get rid of that. And then we have our room. I'm gonna keep the room locked, actually. I'll bring back that rock. And yeah, I can just drag this to a different part of the scene for now. Okay, so there are many different types of lights in Rhino. Um, if you want to know where the lights live, um, there's a couple of different places. The, probably the number one place is if you come up here to your standard toolbar, and then you go to the Create Spotlight, and underneath that is basically every single lighting tool that you have access to in Rhino. So the first thing I think we should try is a spotlight. Um, spotlights are kind of my personal favorite. Um, by the way, can I ask y'all a kind of interesting philosophical question? If we don't have any lights in our scene, how come we're not looking at a black room? Oh, 
Well, okay, it's a good, good question. Um, it's because Rhino sort of auto-populates your scene with this thing called global illumination, which is basically like everything is lit and everything is bouncing off of everything. And so it, it looks exactly like what we see here on the screen. It's like a super soft, kind of generic light feeling, but it doesn't feel like real light, right? Because if we think about how real light behaves, real light is literally coming through these windows, and we can see that it's lighting the windowsill and that it's lighting the ceiling. And, and so that is sort of like, you know, fundamental. It's so awesome that I'm teaching in a room with windows. <laughs> like, almost never happens. Um, but yeah, it's just fundamental to like how we see light in a room. So global illumination is a really useful tool, and actually uh, Rhino specifically calls it skylighting, um, meaning that it's com coming from everywhere. Um, but the way that we're gonna look at lighting is sort of like uh, directional lighting and lighting that is sort of user created, which is basically, and I'm gonna be maybe a tiny bit uh, controversial here, not fake lighting. Um, so, okay, so let's make a spotlight. A spotlight is one of my very favorite um, lighting tools to use, especially for interiors, because uh, spotlights are very dramatic, um, and they're definitely going to kind of like instantly um, take over from this kind of like fluorescent, you know, bleh lighting that you might get. So when you start with a spotlight, it asks you to define the base of a cone. And usually I define the base of the cone just slightly past the object that I actually am interested in lighting, which in this case, let's do the boat. Um, and then I tend to define my spotlights um, using the perspective view. You can also define them you know, using any other view, um, but I just find it's easiest to like, kind of get a handle around the scale um, doing it this way. So I usually make my spotlights pretty darn large. Um, and I just find it easier when I'm making lighting objects to go ahead and do them in whatever way they seem to want to work. Um, and then I kind of rotate them into place. So here you can see we, it wanted us to define that cone as being really flat, but then once you do that, you can kind of move it into a bunch of different places. And so it's pretty common that you may not get it exactly at the angle that you want the first try because you just can't be in more than one viewport at once. Um, like that's fundamentally the way Rhino works. So uh, I usually just try to get it where I want in one viewport, and then I'll come into the other viewport, like this one, for example, and just pick up this uh, adjustment point and double click it, and then it should rotate into place. Now, you can see what has happened here with this. Um, now that we have a light source, we can really kind of see what it's doing, but there's actually maybe a little bit more to it. So if we go to the render menu um, and to render properties, it's probably a good idea to turn off the skylight. Um, I'm turning off the skylight because I really wanna give prece precedence to the lights that I'm creating. Um, can you combine lights with the skylight? I mean, I guess you can, but it's gonna make for a very sort of like diffuse and not, you know, not very sort of dramatic scene. Um, but uh, some t it depends on what, you're, what, what type of an environment you're creating. If you were making a room for kittens, for example, I could totally see using global illumination with like some sparkly point lights. That would be amazing. Um, but if you're trying to create like a, you know, room that has kind of a sense of like, you know, like a little bit like emo, I would definitely go for getting rid of the skylight. So I'm gonna do that. And you can see instantly, um, a lot of people you know, might say, oh my God, that looks terrible, it's awful. Why did you do that? And I'm like, hey, don't worry, we're not even like a tiny bit of the way through with actually lighting this thing. So um, we're gonna add several, several lights. Um, so this is definitely our first uh, sort of spotlight. If you go to any light object and just click it in your scene, um, you can adjust the intensity of it. 
You can also adjust the shadow intensity. Whoop. And you can also uh, adjust the spotlight hardness. So in general, I am usually don't use hard lighting because, bleh, but I mean, I can all, there are no rules and I can totally think of reasons why you might want to have a hard light source. Um, but I usually take the lighting uh, at least to the point where I can't necessarily see that line in the spotlight. Um, and then, of course, you can also make light sources colored. So we'll look at this a little bit more in some detail, but you could go to make, let's say, like a golden light, and usually I would knock the saturation down quite a bit so it's not quite so... Um, I would definitely leave the, um, the value all the way up to bright, the bright, brightest level because it's a, it's a light. <laughs> so it would be, I mean, I guess you could have like a gray light or something, but that, I mean, again, that would be in the realm of like special effects. So yeah, you can make the light have a golden hue. I, I usually don't color my major lights. I usually color like little accent lights or things like that. Um, but definitely, you know, depending on your environment, different light sorts light sources have different color. I mean, if you've uh, played around with um, photography at all, um, you may know that uh, most sort of indoor lighting has a warmer color, so it's somewhere on the amber to yellow spectrum. And if you're in a room like this or in a medical space, it usually tends to have colder lighting or bright daylight lighting. Um, so that would either be like a white light or even a, white, a light that has like a tiny bit of aqua or, or God forbid, a tiny bit of green. Um, and uh, yeah, those are all options that are open to you. So um, I'm gonna switch this back to white just for now um, and we'll get into thinking about other sort of lighting. So the other thing that I really uh, like to do with spotlights is I like to have more than one of them. So I'm gonna take this spotlight and I'm just gonna move it uh, a touch and then I'm gonna take this uh, other spotlight and I'm just gonna move it so that the spotlights are sort of intersecting. And I think I'm gonna take this entire light and just kind of move it over a bit. Um, so that's sort of um, a type of lighting where when you have a light source that sort of has two lights that are sort of pointing towards each other, um, that's what's known in actual professional photography as glamour lighting um, because that's how they do portrait lighting. It's how they do a lot of like Hollywood lighting. Um, and so it's definitely like a sort of known look, right? Um, but again, there are tons of options. So as I, I know I promised that we were going to uh, do something with this object and probably I would introduce you to another um, light object, which is a point light. And so a point light is kind of frustrating actually, and it works well inside of things. Um, and the reason it works well inside of things is because it doesn't, um, if you have it out in the middle of things, it has a tendency to kind of glare all over everything. Um, so it is literally a, like a point of light. So right now it's not in quite in the right spot. So I'm gonna just come down here and we stuck it inside the boat instead of inside the lamp. So I'm just gonna move it back inside the lamp. And yeah, so this is where we're sort of starting to get into party light territory. And um, definitely I'm gonna take this uh, light and just make three of these objects. So they sort of light different points of this object. So yeah, it can be super fun. And I mean, certainly we could also probably take this and maybe twist it to kind of give the light even a little more play. Um, it would make the light forms a little bit larger. Um, but definitely, uh, I think that shooting light through other uh, through other things is just one of it's one of my favorite things to do in Rhino. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab these point lights. I'm going to add the point lights to the lamp uh, layer, and the only reason I'm doing that is because their location is tied to the location of the lamp layer. 
Um, I also, in general, when I'm working in Rhino, I also create a lights layer. Um, and for the lights layer, I would put my so-called major lights, like uh, this spotlight. Change object layer. And then uh, the reason it's great to have um, the lights all on one layer is that you can turn them on and off um, really easily. And of course, we would also maybe turn off the lamp and then we can go back if we need to do some construction or we just don't want to maybe mess with it. One thing that we're going to get into uh, in the next two class periods is the fact that um, when you start getting into light and you start getting into rendering, um, you may or may not start hitting the wall of what your computer and your graphics card is capable of doing. So some people are nodding their heads like, yes. Um, especially if you're working on a laptop, um, so, which most people are. Um, so probably my best advice to you on that is to sort of do a session with your lights and get them where you want them and turn them off. Um, because when your lights are off, they're not factoring into system performance or rendering or any of that kind of stuff. The other option you, can ha you could potentially take on um, is if you're having a lot of system performance issues, you could also reduce your view down to wireframe and just work on things as you need uh, to work on them and then only turn it into you know, the other view when you really need to see that type of detail. Um, because when you're in the wireframe view, you're not drawing nearly as, as much to the screen. So um, this becomes maybe like there are a couple of things that lead to system for performance issues with Rhino. One is um, too much geometry. So let's say that we had this boat and we made an array on a spiral where we had like a thousand of them, uh, you know, arrayed on a spiral. That would be crazy, crazy challenging. Um, so I would definitely think about how you're constructing your forms too if you're running into those issues. Um, there's not really a polygon count in Rhino because it doesn't use polygons. Um, but there is also just kind of a common sense like level of detail, right? So if I'm working on an, um, a room, I don't necessarily, ha we'll get into textures next class, but I don't necessarily need to define geometry for each one of these depressions in the wood grain because I'm gonna slap a texture on this and it's gonna look like it has that level of detail. So I would definitely you know, think about that. Um, if you're having system, uh, system issues, just sort of ask yourself like, what level of detail do I really need on this thing that maybe my room is this big and I'm concerned about like, how to render this uh, or how to sort of um, you know, make geometry for this. M my sort of like, off the cuff response would be, make a box. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't matter, nobody's ever gonna notice that. So, um, yeah, so let's go ahead and take a look at this one more time and then we'll look at a couple of other light sources just to sort of uh, be complete. Um, so I definitely wanna put this in um, our rendered viewport because I don't have all that much in the scene right now. I'll put the lights back on just because I, I feel like it. Um, so the other thing that we wanna sort of think about is uh, all the other types of light. So we have just a couple minutes to kind of get through the other types of light. So rectangular uh, light is fa fun. Um, rectangular light is a good way to, like let's say you have something like um, a desk lamp where it's kind of just in a discrete location, it's hovering over another object and you want something that is square shaped that is gonna put light straight down. A rectangular light is great for that. So you define corners for it. And then uh, right now you can see it's just shooting straight out um, towards this uh, angle. Let me just make that a little bit easier to see. Um, so you can see the light direction right now is going straight up. So if I were to just uh, point this in a different direction. 
Um, rectangular lights are really good if you're thinking about only having one light in your, light, in your lighting scenario. Um, a rectangular light is a good choice because it doesn't sort of limit itself to the actual rectangle. It's sort of just blowing light you know, in a certain direction. Um, the other type of light that you can work with is a directional light. And directional light is also another type of sort of like uh, very, where you just set a direction. Now, the thing that I'm not crazy about, about directional lights, as you can see, it's just like a spotlight, only it has fewer parameters. So, in my opinion, it's a less good spotlight. <laughs> but, I mean, that's just my personal opinion. A lot of people use directional lights, and that's the primary lighting source that they use. But you really, when you use a directional light, you only have that one thing to adjust, which is, you know, the, literally the direction, and then you can adjust the intensity. Um, so, uh, let's see, any other types of lights? I think that actually covers most of it. So, I think I'm going to let you all go like a couple minutes early. It seems like uh, on uh, Monday, we're going to spend some time talking about materials. So, we'll get materials in for all this entire scene. I think I'm going to scale this uh, lamp object down quite a bit because it just looks like, like I am lamp, hear me roar. Um, it's a little too big. And then, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just pick up, the, pick up the pace and get some more done, okay? Have a great weekend.